So in those, I mean, this session, our first speaker is Leonel Rosso. So he's a research scientist at the Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence in Germany. And he's going to talk to us about learning on remain and manipulation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, so uh, can we get maybe some feedback from uh, Zoom to see if uh, they are hearing us properly? Just, just in case, just double check. All right, I guess it should be fine. Um, well, learning or remaining mindful. So basically, we're going to start this session. We're going to have kind of two blocks. First is going to be my talk, uh, which is actually learning on remaining manifolds. The next talk that is going to be by Saren uh, is going to be about learning Riemannian manifolds. So just to make this distinction upfront. Um, and let me get started with probably um, the most basic uh, learning algorithm we can think of for Riemannian manifolds, which is um, geodesic regression. Okay, so to to explain what geodesic regression is about, uh, maybe it makes sense to um, start from what is uh, linear regression, right? So um, I know that probably all of you know this already, but it's important still to introduce this because it will help us to make some parallel between what the geodesic regression is and what linear regression means. All right, so um, first things all. So we're gonna assume that we're gonna be given a set of training inputs um, that live in Euclidean space in the case of geodesic, well, in the case of linear regression, and the, the output for this input basically is just a scalar function, okay? So in the case here on the graph is basically just a scalar input and a scalar output, very simple, right? And I don't want to get you too bored with this. So well, the only thing that we want to do is to find a function that basically models uh, these uh, observations through a linear model, all right? And um, how can we do this? So in this case, actually, we can draw simple a line, right? Whenever in this case, we have a scalar input and um, a scalar function. But uh, of course, we can also generalize that for cases in which the input lives uh, in a higher dimensional recurrent space, okay? So the idea here is that we just want to fit that function, which is linear, uh, so that we, mi we minimize the sum of score errors. So the, number of the, the sum of score errors between the estimates given by our model and the observation that we have. So it's pretty simple. And the, the, the form of those uh, estimates is given by this uh, sum of two terms. And this notation is actually very relevant when it comes to explain and to understand geodesic regression. So the first thing is that we have here the product between the inputs and the set of coefficients u that we want to estimate, which is basically defining, as we're going to see, the, the direction of this, uh, of this linear model plus an independent component, p. All right? So in the case of linear regression, the, uh, the solution is actually very simple. So what we can do here is um, measure, for example, the errors for each of our observations, given the estimates in blue by our linear model, and we minimize the sum of these, all right? Um, in the specific case of linear regression, this actually has a closed form solution, easy peasy, not, not, not really a big deal here. Um, so let's, let's probably spice things up. So now let's consider the case in which our observations now live on a Riemannian manifold. So this can be, for example, that we want to do some regression on the sphere. We want to do regression probably on the cone of SPD matrices, on hyperbolic manifolds, you name it. It's really up to, to, the, to the application. Um, but to keep things simple, we're going to first assume that our input is just a scatter. All right, so by doing so, we still want to find a model that fits this data on the manifold. In this case, the example is given here on the S2 sphere. And what we need to do first is to understand how we compute the estimates of the model. So what is the regression model itself? So this is what we have here on the left. 
so I'm going to go through this straight, kind of do it step by step with, um, see here, it's not working now. Okay, it's not working. Let me see if I can reset this. All right, now it seems that it should be fine. No, it's not fine. Okay. Okay, now we get it. Sorry about that. All right, so here, um, what we're gonna do to compute the estimates for a regression model is to use the exponential map. And I'm gonna explain how we do this with this graph. So first thing is that we're gonna assume um, here on the sphere that we have a point P on the, on, the, on the manifold, and we can build out of this a tangent space. All right. Along this time or on this tangent space, we can define a vector u that we multiply by the input for our regression model. This product of x times u still lives on this tangent space with respect to p. What we can do is this is we, we can assume that this is actually like a kind of a noise-free observation for x times u, because what we can do is to project that to um, to the manifold. So I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's okay. Give me a second. I'm gonna solve this. <coughs> okay, change of setting. Sorry about that. All right. So, um, as I was saying, basically, what we can do is to compute now the exponential map um, for that product. So, basically, what we're going to do is that we're going to get that x times u and project it back to the manifold because we are living on tangent space. But as I said before, this is a kind of noise free observation. And the assumption here, somehow, is that our observations are actually noisy. So, we need to find a way to kind of add a noise in the model, right? So what we're going to do is that we're going to add to this noise-free estimate a tiny noise, which is basically epsilon, that lives on the tangent space of that estimate. And it's just very simple. We compute again the exponential map to map that noise observation back to the manifold. OK? So it's called geodesic regression because what we do with p and the vector u is basically defining a geodesic. So if we, come, if we have a point p, which at the end of the day is kind of the origin or the initial point of the geodesic, the vector u can be understood as the velocity of, the, of this geodesic, and we're going to shoot that geodesic to fit our data. So we're going to see, we're going to see that uh, uh, in the next slides, probably in a more clear way. OK, let's see if this works. OK, better. All right, so before doing that, I want just to draw a parallel between what linear regression is and what this geodesic uh, model actually represents. So here, uh, we have a set of observations as denoted as the black points. Our geodesic regression basically is denoted as this light blue, and the estimates are given by the blue dots, all right? So the first thing that I want you to notice is that um, in the case of Euclid in the space, we can actually find a parallel for P and U. So we can do that um, by saying that the point P is actually um, the point at which we cross the vertical axis for this linear model. And U is basically defining the direction of that linear model. So at the end of the day, what happens is that um, the geodesics are basically representing a kind of a straight lines in the Cleveland space, okay? Roughly speaking. Um, and in the case of the linear model, the exponential map that we observe in the geodesic case corresponds basically just to the notation that we saw before, which is the product of x times the coefficients u plus p, okay? All right, so just as an additional parallel, as I said before, for the linear regression, we just want to minimize 
this objective function, which is basically the error between the estimates and the observations in order to find P and U. So these are basically the, the parameters that we wanna find for the linear model. For the regression model, it's pretty much the same thing, but the only thing that we need to do here is to include the uh, geodesic distance in order to measure uh, the difference between the estimates and the observations. All right, so how can we do this? Because we are changing now the objective function and this actually brings uh, some few challenges. So the parameters that we need to estimate for the geodesic are P and U, right? The ones that are defining our geodesic. And what we want to do, as I said before, is we, we want to minimize the sum of these uh, distance, uh, geodesic distance between the observations and the estimates given by the model. So the main problem is that we don't have a closed form solution as before, but actually we can formulate this as an optimization problem, of course, because it's all about this. But as you saw before, the point is that our observations live on a remaining manifold and therefore we need to use the gradient set that we just, before, that we just studied before uh, in the talk by, by Noemi, all right? So I'm not gonna give details about the geodesic, sorry, about the gradient descent specifically because uh, I assume you're already experts on it. Um, but I will try to maybe give you a hint on how this is actually implemented. Um, all right, so the first thing that we need to do is to get, of course, our training data, so set of uh, inputs X and observations Y living on the manifold. And the output of that should be the initial point of our geodesic model and the vector U on the tangent space of it. We initialize P and U eventually randomly. And we can initialize uh, the step size for the gradient descent. We can also have a kind of upper bound on it. We're gonna see why need, we need this. And in practical terms, it's usually good to center the data, okay? So once we have that, the first step or the loop for the optimization for this regression, geographic regression model boils down to two steps mainly. So we want to find the updates for our initial point P, which is basically computing the gradient of the objective function, which is this one here. So the sum of geodesic distances. And we execute a simple gradient descent multiplied by alpha and this uh, estimate that is given on the tangent space, we project it back to the defining fold using the exponential map, okay? After that, we need also to update our vector u. And this is actually simpler in the sense that we compute, again, the gradient with respect to u. This is an Euclidean gradient because u actually lives on the tangent space. Here, we just compute the update, but remember that u, the first one, so the one that we had previously was respect to P. So to our previous P that we knew, and now we have a new one. So we need to parallel transport the estimate from the old P to the new P, okay? After that, the only thing that we need to do is to check some convergence criteria. So in our case, what we can do is to check if we get an improvement with respect to the objective function. If we do, we then carry out the updates that we computed before, and we do an update on the step size. We can actually increase it if we want, because that kind of tells us that we are in the right direction. If this doesn't apply, then we just decrease the step size. We don't carry out the updates, and then we trade over. And that's all, uh, that's all we need. So um, these are just the descriptions of the steps that I just described. Um, and that's basically the, the main recipe that we need to implement the geodesic regression. Um, let's have a look at actually how this looks like in the sphere. So here we have um, a set of points denoted by the black dots. So these are actually the points that we want to fit by, by our regression model. Here we are measuring the geodesic distances that, uh, that are depicted by this uh, kind of dash or dotted line in red. And the initialization of P and U are basically given here. So we have huge errors, right? I think it's very obvious. Um, and then the optimized parameters basically gives us this model. So we have a very beautiful uh, geodesic feeding the data where optimal P and U given by these two here, okay? So 
this is actually, this converges uh, relatively quickly. Uh, but so far we have talked about the very simple case, right? So the simple case in the sense that our input is a scalar. So what we can do is to uh, spice things up to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, and then consider that our input is actually living on a higher dimensional space. So now X belongs to RD. It can be bidimensional, it can be also high dimension. It doesn't really matter. And again, our observations still stay on the manifold. So what this basically means is that now, instead of having a single vector U, we're gonna have a set of vectors of D for U. And we, I'm gonna show you how actually this looks like. So now the parameters are actually P. So again, the region for our geodesic. But now we have D geodesics that we're gonna shoot from P, okay? So basically this is how this looks like. So we have a single P, which is the origin of our geodesic. And in this case, for example, where X lives in a bidimensional space, we have two geodesics. So here denoted by these uh, light blue geodesics on the sphere. And what happens is that kind of each of them are uh, representing uh, kind of different distribu um, contribution for the geodesic model in order to feed uh, the data. All right, so let's talk about how we can actually estimate this. So the first thing that we need to consider is that by giving this origin P and for example, the vectors U that basically correspond to the dimensionality of the input space, we're gonna compute the estimates pretty much in the same way as before. So here we have uh, the estimates are basically given that by the exponential map of the sum between uh, the product of X and uh, the vectors UD. So this basically corresponds to optimize the very similar error function that we had before or objective function, but now we need to carry out the optimization for more than one single U vector, all right? So another way to see this is actually to consider that the different vectors that we have that are defining kind of different geodesics is kind of a curve basis that we're trying to find in order to fit the observations in the best way. So this is a way, a different way to, to, to analyze this uh, kind of multivariate geodesic regression. So with this in mind, again, what we need to do is to compute the errors using the geodesic distance and with these estimates given by the multivariate uh, geodesic regression model. Okay, so I think I'm having again issues with the... Okay, now, so let's have a look at how actually this, this works. Uh, for a similar example, where we, now we have only uh, a bidimensional input and we have actually here the initialization that is again random for P and for the, T, the, the two vectors that we have here. So U1 and U2. This is the initialization. We have here errors again of the estimates given by our model. And um, the results after the optimization look like this. So as you can see, the estimates are way, way, way better now after running the optimization. The optimization looks pretty similar. It's pretty much the same thing that we had before, but now we have to run the optimization for different use according to the dimensionality of our input space, okay? Important to note here is that, of course, if your input X is high dimensional, then the optimization problem becomes very complex because we need to estimate um, as, as many uh, uh, U vectors as dimensions we have, okay? So this is something that we need to take care of. But for kind of uh, low dimensional problems, I think things, things work out. So now I'm gonna move on to explain the first concept regarding Riemann and Gaussian distribution. But before that, I would like to ask if there is any question from the audience regarding the geodesic regression, the multivariate regression that we just saw. So. All good? Okay, cool. So I will try to keep the math really light uh, for these uh, next sessions because 
I understand we are kind of uh, exhausted after a long day. But what I would like to, uh, to explain now is how can we actually define a Riemannian Gaussian distribution? So I understand that just this linear fitting or geodesic fitting is not that appealing because we have way more complex problems and domains and therefore we would like maybe to go for probabilistic models. And of course, the, the workhorse of probabilistic models is actually Gaussian distributions, right? So the first thing that we need to probably ask is, can we define it? Like, if, and if, if there's a way, how can we do this? So in literature, actually, there are like roughly four approaches to do this, namely wrapping a Gaussian distribution. I'm gonna explain about that. I'm gonna explain this uh, in, in a second. Then we have the concept of remaining Gaussian distribution, which is a kind of maximum entropy distribution that we can define for remaining manifolds. And then there are other two that we don't cover right now, which is um, understanding the Gaussian distribution as the solution of a heat kernel. And it's actually very cool because heat kernels are very well understood for a lot of Riemannian manifolds that are known. And therefore we can actually exploit this knowledge to uh, formulate a Gaussian distribution on a Riemannian manifold. And this actually connects also with something I'm gonna talk about later, which is kernels. And um, last but not least, there are also other ways to define Gaussian-like distributions. And when I talk about Gaussian-like is that they actually don't have a proper normalization constant, but still behave like a kind of Gaussian distribution. So kind of bell shape of uh, distribution. All right, so first of all, wrapping or wrap Gaussian distribution. So the, the intuition here is that what we wanna do, we're gonna assume that we have a Gaussian distribution that lives on the Euclidean space, and specifically on a tangent space, that is Euclidean, of course, and we want to somehow wrap this Gaussian distribution on the manifold. That's, that's all the intuition that we need to care of. So how can we do this? So the, the, the fact is that to wrap this on the manifold, we need a function that actually carries out this wrapping behavior. So, um, okay, here it goes again. All right, so to do that, uh, the first thing that we need to do is to consider how the density that we have of the Gaussian distribution on the Euclidean space changes when we actually use the wrapping function. And this is just all about the change of variable theorem. So I will try to keep this simple, but what is important here is that we have here on the left, the wrap density of our Gaussian distribution. And this boils down basically to um, compute the density in Euclidean space times um, the determinant of the Jacobian of this wrapping function, C. And kind of the usual assumption, the usual assumption for when wrapping this uh, Euclidean Gaussian distribution is that this is a diffeomorphism, okay? So this function represents a diffeomorphism. This is important because we need to compute the inverse of it to compute here the determinant. What this part, this part that is actually the absolute value determinant here, basically. Um, what this actually is representing is that um, how the volume of the density here is affected by wrapping, by this wrapping function C. Okay, so this actually reflected here in the wrap density. If we use this change of variable theorem and we compute the log likelihood, then we have this. So it's actually very simple just to compute the log probability of that. So this is the log of a uh, wrap normal distribution. It's pretty much following this equation here. And then we have the log probability of the Euclidean one with respect to a mean centered at uh, mu zero with covariance sigma minus the log determinant of the de derivative of the wrapping function. In most cases, this diffeomorphism is actually the, a composition of the exponential map and the parallel transport. And I'm gonna explain that just right away. So let me show you this actually in the, in the hyperbolic space of dimension two. First thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna set a specific uh, mu zero. So this can be, for example, any point on the manifold, but usually the origin point on the manifold for the case of the Lorentz model of the hyperbolic manifold, we're gonna decide that is actually one zero. And we're gonna assume that our Gaussian distribution lives here. So the Euclidean one, we're gonna sample just, uh, or we're gonna draw a sample from this Gaussian distribution here. 
And once we have that sample, what we're gonna do is to move that sample from this fixed mean, mu zero, to the mean that we assume we already have. So what we did, okay. Right, okay. So here we go. What we do, as I said before, we parallel transport this sample that lives in the tangent space with respect to mu zero towards mu. Again, what happens is that this sample still lives on the tangent space with respect to mu. And what we need to do is to map back that function to the manifold. So you should already know what we actually plan to do after that, which is use the exponential map. Which means that the composition of the parallel transport of the exponential map represents the diffeomorphism that we have here. And for most non-manifolds, this corresponds to the diffeomorphism. There are, of course, some uh, characteristics of deterministic, like of the for specific manifolds for which this doesn't apply, but in general, this actually works out. Okay. So, second type of Gaussian distribution which is the Riemannian Gaussian distribution. So this actually was proposed uh, by Xavier Pernick some years back. And the idea here is that given a mean and a covariance, we want to find a Gaussian distribution of Riemannian manifold that maximizes entropy. So this is actually a very standard way to find Gaussian distributions uh, also in Euclidean space. And the shape of it is very, very similar to what we already know. So there is a constant here, which is the normalizing constant. And as you can see here in the exponential term, we have the product of the log map for a sample X with respect to the mu of the Gaussian distribution. And here we have lambda, which basically corresponds to uh, the concentration matrix. So these are the parameters defined in the Gaussian distribution of Riemann manifolds. Um, the key challenge here is actually to compute this normalization constant C and this concentration matrix. For Kind of mild assumptions for a specific manifolds, we can safely approximate that Gaussian distribution to this. So the normalization constant looks quite similar to the one that we usually find in Euclidean space. Uh, and here we recover the inverse of the covariance out of the concentration matrix that we had before. And this is the so called Riemannian Gaussian distribution. Okay. Again, if you read the text, if you read the papers of Xavier Panek, you might realize that. This, for example, doesn't apply specifically uh, for specific conditions of the manifolds, but um, all in all, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a safe approximation to use. And actually it's very precise. All right, so given that, let me show you actually how this looks like in a couple of manifolds. So here we have the, the, the well-known sphere for which we have a mean on the sphere and the covariance lives on the tangent space of the manifold. And here we have another example on the cone of SPD matrices. Okay, so here we have two means. This is just an example of having um, an error between the Euclidean mean and the, uh, and the Riemannian mean. And here the covariance is basically denoted by this ellipsoid in, in pink color. So as you might have realized, both for the RAP Gaussian distribution and for this Riemannian one, the two parameters that we need to compute is basically the data mean and the covariance that lies in the tangent space of the data mean. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. First, how can we compute the mean for Riemannian data? So the kind of the, the, the algorithm to use is basically built on the fresh and mean. And what we want to do is to compute a vector mean that basically minimizes the variance of the observations, or the equivalence of this is basically that we want to minimize the, the sum of square uh, manifold distances. Okay? So this is pretty much the same thing that we do in Euclidean space. The difference, of course, as you might uh, already probably anticipate, is that the fact that we are having here the geodesic distance doesn't allow us maybe to compute this in closed form. So again, it's an optimization problem. So the formula to compute the mean for this data is basically computing the differences with respect to the mean of all of our all our observations, compute the sum of it, and then that will give us an estimate of the mean on the, clean, on the tangent space, which we project back to the manifold using the exponential map with respect to the 
current estimate of the mean. So we're gonna see that in a very simple illustrative example. So um, this is important to note. So the algorithm usually converges in less than 10 iterations. And for the example that we actually have here, it takes two or three iterations, if I'm wrong. This is very quick. So let's try to do the exercise. So here we have a bunch of uh, black dots representing our data. We want to compute the mean for our, that data living on S2. And we're gonna give an initial estimate, which can be, for example, any point that we have in our data set. Or you can also randomly initialize, but it's usually safer to, to choose one of these points. After that, we're gonna basically compute um, the, um, okay, here we go. Right, so we're gonna compute the log map of each of these points with respect to the mean that we have. After that, basically that will give us an estimate of the mean on the tangent space, which is this red dot. And then we're gonna use the exponential map to, um, sorry, to map back that mean to the manifold. So if we iterate that again, we compute again the log map for all the samples we compute now the estimate on the tangent space, which is now very close to the one that we had before. And we map it back to the manifold with explanation map. And that's that's all we need to do. Now it converge, so that's it, we're, we're, we're done. So once we have the mean, the only thing that is left to do is to compute the covariance. And the covariance is actually very simple to compute because it lies on the tangent space. So our tangent space is Euclidean and we just need to compute the covariance using the log maps between our samples and the mean vector, as it shows here. Okay. All right. So, questions so far regarding the Gaussian distribution of Riemannian manifolds? All right. So, of course, a single Gaussian distribution probably might not do a good job. And what I'm going to describe now is a Riemannian version of Gaussian mission models. And what I want to also emphasize is that for some people that might be familiar, for example, with uh, current approaches or current generative models like normalizing flows or diffusion models, um, there are also Riemannian versions built, for example, on the notion of Riemannian Gaussian distributions or Rob Gaussian distributions that we just uh, studied before. So just to keep it there uh, in mind. So we didn't, we didn't cover this, of course, because of time. But we're going to go for the simplest model uh, in terms of uh, generative models, which is uh, here the the, uh, the GMM. Okay, so let's get it started. To be everyone on the same page, we're going to have a really quick uh, reminder of what GMM are in this case. So basically, it's just uh, a bunch of Gaussians that we have here fitting our data. Okay, for each of them, explaining a subset of our training data set, and this is actually very well used for, for clustering algorithms. Um, and the idea here, of course, is to uh, optimize the means and the covariances of these Gaussians uh, with respect to the GMM likelihoods, okay? So here in this case, our data for the normal GMM uh, belongs to the Euclidean space. And when it comes to optimize the parameters, which are the weighting coefficients, the means and the covariance matrices, we rely on the log likelihood of the GMM. So this is of course a, a way easier function to optimize. Um, and def therefore the objective is basically just to maximize the log likelihood of the GMM model. All right. So um, this is just the algorithm and this is important to keep it in mind because there might be some changes when it comes to the remaining version. I just want to go quickly through it. We have of course the input, our data set, in this case belonging to the Euclidean space and we want to basically find the means, covariances, and uh, weighting coefficients of the GMM. So we can initialize that randomly, but a warm start is usually way better. In this case, we use k-means. And um, after that, okay, just one second. I have something with pointers today. All right, so this is the loop. The optimization loop, which is basically the expectation maximization loop. So first thing that we do is uh, actually the expectation. So we basically compute the responsibilities uh, for each of the, our uh, data points. And after that, um, okay. Okay. All 
Okay, I think I'm. Okay, let's do it in the old way. So after that, basically, what I want to do is to maximize, to co basically, to carry out the maximization step. So in expectation maximization, what that means is that I want to I want to compute new means, new covariances, and new weighting coefficients for GMM. So this is kind of the, the main recipe for uh, the expectation maximization algorithm used in GMMs and using other kind of models as well. Um, but we're gonna see actually how this changes when it comes to um, learn these GMMs or Riemann manifolds. So first thing that I want to show is actually how this works in nuclear space. So this is actually how it converges the EM algorithm. And here we can compare against the K-means initialization, for example. Um, so it's very simple. And now we have a nice clustering of our, of our data. So now the problem is that our data belong to the Riemannian manifold. It can be the sphere again, SPD, hyperbolic, you name it. And the problem is exactly the same. So we want to, uh, for example, optimize the likelihood um, of the GMM, which basically means that what we want to do is for a set of data living on the manifold, we want to optimize the weighting coefficients, which is basically a set of scalars. But now our mean function, our mean vectors belong to a remaining manifold. And this is actually what brings the, the challenge when it comes to, to the optimization of the GMM parameters. So again, as in the Euclidean case, nothing actually changes in terms of the objective function. We're going to compute the log likelihood of the GMM, and we're going to uh, have as an objective pretty much the same thing. But what changes is actually the domain of the parameters that we are optimizing. So how can we do this? So this is the EM that we had before in the Euclidean case, and I'm going to try to go step by step through the changes that actually uh, are relevant for the Riemannian case. So this is what changes. So of course, the first thing that changes is the domain of our problem. So here what we have is basically the means belong to the uh, manifold, our covariance matrices to the tangent space of uh, the mean. And the first thing that we're going to observe here is that the responsibilities that we compute in the expectation step now use our Riemannian Gaussian distribution. OK, so that shouldn't be a surprise for us. But of course, when we compute the mean in the maximization step, we have actually to do something very close to the friction mean. It's just that here we are using the responsibilities uh, that we computed before in the expectation step. Once this converges, which actually, as I said before, might take between three and five iterations, we compute the covariance matrix on the tangent space. Again, using the responsibilities that we computed before using our Riemannian Gaussian distribution. Okay? So now I think I will try to switch to the collab that we have here, just to explain a little bit uh, how this actually works with some uh, toy data. So here we have uh, data is two that has a kind of C shape, okay? So what we're gonna do is to learn a Gaussian mission model using uh, the Riemannian approach that we just explained. So basically, I'm going to show you the results. I won't try to go through the code. Um, but as I said before, we're going to share this uh, with you guys so that you can check the collab later. But this is actually the result of our um, expectation maximization. So what is cool here is that, um, can we see? OK. Here we have three, GM, three components, GMM, basically. Um, the one at the top, the red one, and the yellow one. And um, what I want you to, to keep in mind here is that the density that we have on the sphere on the right fits pretty closely the real density of the data, OK? So basically, there are no holes. So when I compute the density on the sphere, there are no holes in the, the, in the support of the data. And this is actually very relevant when it comes to fit these kind of GMMs because it's actually representing very closely the distribution of the data that we had before. But there might be other approaches that actually do something slightly similar, but fundamentally wrong. So what happens here is that we might think of just choosing a single tangent space, 
in which I will project all the data that I have in manifold using the exponential, sorry, using the log map. And I will use basically that tangent space to train a GMM in the Euclidean space. So using the former approach. And then once I train that, I project the means that I computed in the tangent space back to the manifold, okay? Which is actually what we saw, we can see in the, in the, in the right sphere. So if you had a look at the density, even more in the density that we actually see in the middle of the data, the, first of all, uh, the mean of the second Gaussian of the red Gaussian is a little bit off from the support of the data. So this is already telling us that this single tangent space training is actually not working well. And if you check the density that we actually retrieve out of it, we have some holes and we have actually density that is assigned out of the distribution of the data. So it's giving us a, a wrong density, okay? So even if we kind of use partially some tools of Riemannian geometry, the fact that we assume that the data can all be projected to a single tangent space is flawed because we are including distortions by assuming a single tangent space, okay? So of course I can choose other kind of tangent space origins. Um, I will try to show you that quickly. I don't know if I managed to have it here. No, I think I don't have it here. Okay, I know it should be here, sorry. Okay, here. So this is the second case in which I choose a kind of a better tangent space origin, which is um, kind of in the, in the middle of our uh, data distribution. I did exactly the same process. So I project the data with the log map to the tangent space, learn my GMM, project back the estimated mean second variances, and this is the density that we get. So th this one, it resembles a little bit closer, the one that we had with the full Riemannian uh, case, but still you observe some holes, right? Like between um, the, um, the red Gaussian and the yellow Gaussian, it's even, it's even clearer. So here we again see that the distribution of the density that we get is actually not a good fit for the distribution of data that we have. Okay, so with this, I want to tell you that it's actually very important uh, to understand well how we can actually use these tools when it comes to formally learned algorithms uh, using Riemannian manifolds. So with that, I want to quickly uh, explain uh, Riemannian Gaussian processes. So just to have everyone on the same page, I will quickly give an intro to what Gaussian processes are. So here is pretty much the same regression problem that we have talked about before in terms of regression, right? Geodesic regression. Um, but of course, when it comes to Gaussian processes, uh, what we're considering here is that we have a Gaussian prior basically over functions, all right? And basically in this case, this is the prior that we observed there on the square on the right. So we have, for example, a constant mean function and just uh, a covariance function that measures the similarity uh, between, between the data. And this is the prior that we have. So once we have observations, uh, in this case, everything is Euclidean, then what we can do uh, is uh, we can use these observations and the prior of a Gaussian process in order to compute the posterior for a specific observation, a new observation that we have. And this is actually uh, carried out by, first of all, computing the resulting joint distribution between our Gaussian prior and the model of our data, which is also following a Gaussian distribution. And uh, from this joint distribution, we can actually uh, condition on the uh, new observation that we have. So what that means is that, for example, on the top, um, plot, we can see, for example, how the Gaussian process looks like. All right, so for a set of data, uh, the full um, envelope in blue and the solid line represents respectively um, the variance of the Gaussian process and the mean function for, for the posterior. So given this, um, I want to highlight two uh, um, functions here. So as you might see, uh, when it comes to work with Gaussian process, the key component of the Gaussian process is actually the kernel. And the probably most well-known kernel is the square exponential kernel, but probably the most generic one is the matron kernel. And this is important because we're gonna talk about the relationship later on. Um, I just want to uh, 
I won't go through the details of the, of the variables here, but probably what is more important for you is that we can recover the typical exponential, um, a square exponential kernel um, for basically um, an infinite uh, value for uh, new. And what this means, this infinite constant here is that actually we assume that we have infinite smoothness. And that's relevant because if we want to sample from a Gaussian process that has this square exponential kernel, we will always get very smooth samples. Well, by using the Matron kernel, we can actually have uh, non-smooth uh, samples. And this, this difference is actually very relevant when it comes to the process that we actually want to model. So what is the problem when it comes to Riemannian data? So we can actually have two problems. So the first one, when the input data lives on a Riemannian manifold, and of course, when the outputs live on a Riemannian manifold, all right? So as I said before, the Gaussian processes are basically defined by the mean function and the kernel. And when it comes to the first problem, what we have to do is to actually formulate kernels that capture properly the geometry of the Riemannian manifold of interest. And on the other hand, if we actually have uh, manifold value outputs, we need to consider that the mean function should live on this Riemannian manifold. And to do that, we actually need to consider multi-output kernels. So we cannot go anymore through the assumption that for a multi-output Gaussian process, we can have independent Gaussian process uh, that are scalar. So we cannot do this anymore. So I'm gonna explain the first problem. So now um, we want to model a function in which we have manifold value uh, inputs and just a scalar value uh, output. So this is actually a, a very cool example on the Gaussian process on the sphere where we actually have uh, data on the sphere S2 and the value of the function is basically described by the color on the sphere, okay? And we actually want to do is to, again, impose a Gaussian prior on functions whose uh, inputs live on Riemannian manifolds. And here, actually, the problem, as I said before, comes on formulating kernels that can actually capture the geometry of the Riemannian manifold of interest. So let me tell you quickly what we can do to do that. First thing is that we can take, as an example, the most well-known um, kernel, which is the square exponential kernel, that actually relies on the Euclidean distance, which is there, or, or that shows up actually in the exponential of the kernel. And of course, as you already know, we can actually not use this distance to measure the similarity between two points living on the Riemannian manifold. So the first thing that might actually come to our minds is that, well, let's just replace that distance by the geodesic distance, right? So it's kind of the most obvious step to do. But um, this actually doesn't work. So it doesn't work because um, by using just the USA distance in the, in the square exponential kernel, we cannot guarantee that the full kernel matrix is positive definite. And this actually brings a problem. One thing that we can do is, well, actually we can check the eigenvalues of the kernel matrix for which we can still guarantee that uh, our kernel matrix uh, will be positive definite. So this is something that we did um, inspired on the couple of papers that you can see at the bottom, where for each manifold, what we did was to sample the manifold and to compute the minimum eigenvalue of the kernel matrix. And we can then find what is the minimum value for beta for which we can guarantee the positive definiteness of the kernel matrix. Okay? This is important. It's important to note that this sampling is, is only required once. So once you know the manifold in which you are, for example, SPD of three dimensions or hyperbolic or five dimensions, you only carry out one sampling process, which is probably very uh, computationally expensive. But once you find beta mean, that's all you need to do. This comes with, with, a, with, a, with a problem, which is a kind of naive generalization. So we saw before, um, basically the geodesic distance can uh, capture only locally 
the geometry of the manifold. And what we should actually do is to consider, so to speak, different geodesics that will be, a, that will be able to capture the whole geometry. So in this case, for example, we have the circle as one, and at the top, we have the naive generalization. So we use only the geodesic distance in our kernel, and we can actually just measure um, very locally uh, the, the similarity between X and Y, but we cannot capture the full geometry of the manifold. So what we can do is to run actually different geodesics in a kind of periodic way. And in that way, we can actually measure uh, the, uh, or consider the full geometry of the manifold that will tell us properly the similarity between two points on the manifold. So how can we do this? So um, I will try to give you kind of a glimpse of the approach. The idea here is that we can consider that there is a relationship between the kernel uh, or the square exponential kernel and um, this is stochastic partial differential equation that you see uh, on the right, um, in which we have the Laplacian of, of, the, um, of the function and Gaussian white noise. So basically by this relationship in here, we can generalize kernels from Euclidean space to the Riemannian setting. How can we do this? Well, first we have to assume that the Riemannian manifold is compact. So this doesn't apply for non-compact manifolds, unfortunately, but um, in one of our papers, we actually explain how to generalize this to non-compact manifolds like the hyperbolic one. So actually we have pretty much the same stochastic partial differential equation in which the only thing that we need to do is to change the Gaussian white noise by the Riemannian analog of this Gaussian noise. And in, in, instead of computing the Laplacian, actually what we get, uh, what we have to compute is the Laplace Beltrami operator, which actually depends on the metric of the manifold that we have. By doing so, we can actually leverage uh, what is called the Mercer's theorem that tells us that a kernel can be actually described as the infinite sum of eigenvalues, uh, of the product eigenvalues and eigenfunctions f. And for now, let's say that we don't care so much about where these come from, but this relationship is relevant because we can exploit that expression to generalize the x squared exponential kernel to the remaining case for compact manifolds, in which you can easily identify that uh, we have pretty much the same expression between the Mercer's theorem and the generalization of the square exponential there on the right. Important to note is that basically uh, this lambda n and the Fn corresponds to the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the Laplace uh, Beltrami operator that we just described for this uh, stochastic PDE equation. Importantly, we can actually have the same generalization for the matron kernel. So we can have a smooth and non-smooth samples um, for uh, these two kernels. And kind of what the intuition behind these kernels is that um, we are kind of, uh, so the eigenfunctions and the, and the eigenvalues are kind of representing a, a spectral decomposition um, that actually covers for different frequencies um, the, uh, the geometry of the manifold. So uh, this is kind of what, what happens with this uh, Mercer's theorem and the connection with, with the kernels. All right, so um, I will just go quickly to give you uh, a glimpse on how this looks like. So on the top, we have just the prior um, for a Gaussian process with inputs uh, belonging to the Riemannian manifold. And at the bottom, we have uh, already a Gaussian process that we train uh, using these kernels that we describe on the sphere. So we have the mean, the variance, and some posterior samples that we get out of it. And uh, with this, I would like to, to wrap up the presentation by just telling, us, uh, telling you that we have, I mean, there is this book of Xavier Pernet that covers some of the basics on statistics on Riemannian manifolds. So for example, the Riemannian Gaussian distribution that I explained, and we actually have a very nice tool um, that we just released, which is geometric kernels. Uh, this is actually a very nice um, toolbox for um, geometric kernels that I just described, uh, mainly for compact manifolds. Uh, it seems that we are gonna soon probably release the non-compact version, uh, but, you just need to use these kernels and plug it into your regression process and that's all you need. 
So if you don't need to care about the math, that's okay. You can use those kernels uh, there. So with that, um, I would like to thank you for, for listening. Uh, it has been a long day, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. So do you guys have any questions uh, before we setting up everything for the last speaker? Uh, could you come to the come to the mic, please? Yeah, thank you for the talk. I'm <coughs> not an expert, so the question can be naive. In the Riemannian case, can you define a Mahalanobis distance? So in the Euclidean case, for instance, the, you have a Gaussian, the lossy of uh, points at the same Mahalanobis distance are ellipsoids. So what happens in the Riemannian case? Yeah, actually, like in general terms, you, you can indeed uh, use the, uh, basically like the, the, the covariance, for example, to, to um, combine it with the Riemannian metric so that you have a kind of uh, Mahalanobis uh, notion uh, also in the Riemannian metric. So it, it is possible to use that covariance uh, along with the Riemannian metric as well. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, yeah, great explanation, thanks. Um, so you mentioned using normalizing flows here. So is the idea to start with a Gaussian, apply the flow, and then wrap at the very end, since the flow itself is a function on Rn still? Yeah, so basically what, what, um, what the idea is behind is that um, we define continuous normalizing flows. This is actually a work of a couple of guys uh, that were published in, I think, a couple of years ago, uh, in 2020 or 2021, can I remember? Uh, but basically what they do is, so at the end of the day, the main problem is that you need to solve an ODE for this a continuous normalizing flow. And in the Euclidean case, it's easy. So this is well understood, but in the remaining case, it isn't. So the, the trick here, uh, the intuition is just that you project your data um, and you use, for example, this, uh, this chart notion or this exponential map or log maps. In the case of, of, of projecting to clean space, you use the log map you solve an ODE in this tangent space and the solution you projected back to the manifold. And then you run this over time to find the solution of, uh, of your ODE on the Riemann manifold. Right. So this is better because the computational tools for solving ODEs for Euclidean space are very quick and well understood while in the Riemannian setting is actually not. So then you exploit these mappings to go back and forth between the tangent space uh, ODEs and the manifold. I see. To, and to read more, you said it's called continuous normalizing flow. Yeah, I can give you the reference later right. on. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you for the presentation. So I work with um, uh, learning problems on, on, on remaining manifolds also. But uh, I, so I always get asked, especially I work with sort of wrapping the Gaussian and so on kind of thing. And I, I use several tangent uh, spaces so that I can control distortion, right? And that works well empirically and so on. And you, you showed us this, that when we use one tangent space, you can get really bad results and then you need to consider that carefully. And that has been also my experience, but I always get asked and I don't know the answer. How do you know how many tangent spaces you need, right? That's a very good question. And then uh, in other words, it, would there be a bound on distortion based on the number of tangent spaces you use? Have you any see anything about that before? Yeah, I think that's a very deep question. Um, I, I don't want to, to take the time of Soren, who is already online. Uh, Sorry. I, I think it's, it's an open problem. I think I don't have. I can. I think we can take the 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 the, the question offline. Hmm. Uh, but definitely, is is not it's not obvious like how many tangent spaces you may use. I think it really depends on the curvature of your manifold, for example. Hmm. Um, and for, for some well-known manifolds, maybe there are some um, kind of uh, minimum number of tangent spaces that you might need in order to cover uh, the whole manifold. So, right, yeah, starts. thank you. Uh, just, just to finish, uh, yeah, I agree. I think it would be something given curvature, concentration, yeah. assuming compactness, there will be yeah. some th theorem, yeah. Yes. Okay, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>